So welcome everyone to today's uh, Center for Educational Neuroscience seminar. Uh, it is my great pleasure to welcome Professor Nandini Chatterjee Singh uh, to give the talk today. Uh, Nandini is a senior national program officer at the UNESCO Mahatma Gandhi Institute of Education for Peace and Sustainable Development in New Delhi. Uh, Nandini trained as a physicist, but subsequently has trained uh, and carried out some, a lot of research in um, Cognitive neuroscience, her research areas include music, multilingualism, autism, and uh, learning disorders. Uh, Nandini is now a science policy practitioner in education, where she seeks to prioritize student emotional well being in school education policy using evidence from brain research. And uh, um, Nandini was recently contributed to the um, Mahatma Gandhi Institute's international report uh, on the science and evidence-based education assessment. So today, Nandini will be talking to us about can gameplay build a better world? So it, as we go along, if you have any questions, do pop them in the chat and uh, we'll pick them up at the end. So over to you, Nandini. Thank you very much, Michael. And I hope you can uh, hear me clearly. Uh, thank you for this opportunity and um, I'm excited about uh, talking to more of you. I've uh, met some of you in my at my previous trip to uh, to UCL last year uh, as part of developing a social emotional learning framework. So uh, some of the work that we do at UNESCO MGIP is um, is focused around using digital pedagogies for social and emotional learning. And that's what I'm hoping to share with you today. So um, I dare say the sustainable development goals are something that many of you are familiar with. And SDG 4 focuses on education. And 4.7, so target 7 specifically focuses on what is called global citizenship. So these are uh, the 17 um, goals that have been defined by the member states who are part of the United Nations. and. Um, Goal 4.7 is, is, is a long one, but the one that I, the part that I want you to focus on is um, building a, a, promoting a culture of peace and nonviolence. Okay. So this sounds um, rather grandiose, and um, but I think we kind of underestimate how important um, peace is for uh, many of us to, to flourish and to grow. And uh, there are a number of areas in the world that are not at peace, okay? But in order for us to probably uh, operationalize or begin to think what uh, peace might be, and you know, we've probably not given, may not have given enough thought to building peaceful mindsets, I um, wanted to pause um, a wee bit and um, just get some participation from the audience here. So if you would, um, either whip out your phones and scan the QR code or um, um, type in this um, number at menti.com and um, answer a question for me on um, that, that you'll see up there, which is what's the one word that comes to your mind when you think about peace? If you would please answer that and we look at the poll together maybe. So I'll stop sharing and share another slide. Can we get a few more answers? Okay, to return back then. So in general, from what I see, it's um, it seems to be 
words that are associated with feeling um, positive or um, uh, beginning to want to um, think of a, of a state of mind, which is, um, uh, I like to think of it as calming. Yeah. We also have um, a lot of discussion around a mental health crisis that seems to be looming. Okay. And uh, there's been an alarming increase in anxiety and uh, emotional issues from uh, a number of people. And the number is rather alarming for adolescents, uh, which essentially means that we need to start doing something about it because the numbers have increased so much. Okay. So if you go back and look into the literature, and um, if I sort of equate for the purposes of this talk, uh, peace and happiness, uh, there's been a fair amount of research that has gone in to show that um, one of the best predictors of uh, human happiness, and in our case, we're also talking about peace, is the quality of a person's relationships. Okay. And human relationships um, are, a are a consequence of behaviors that uh, we all uh, sort of interact and exhibit in our daily lives. And all of these behaviors are a consequence of a number of decisions that we are making. Okay. So the question that um, at MGIP that we've been trying to address is, uh, can we begin to train the brain to make decisions that lead towards healthy relationships? And can we try and embed this uh, in learning and education? So can we make this part of school systems? Just as you begin to teach uh, children to do literacy and numeracy, can we begin to also uh, teach them how to uh, form good relationships and what might be the skills and competencies that underlie building these relationships? Okay. So um, just a quick jump in into uh, some of the neuroscience of decision making. Okay. And um, so that's, that's a picture of, uh, of the brain when you're making any decision. It's an, it's an impulsive decision that you're making. So uh, there are a combination of circuits that are at play here. There is the reward circuit uh, that you already see. You see circuits, areas involved in executive control. There are associ areas associated with memory and, and habit formation that you clearly use because of things that you've learned and acquired over the past. And then the, of course there's um, inhibitory control. Okay, so should you do make one choice versus another? So over the years, as, pe as people have um, studied this in greater detail, and now there's a lot that we know about decision-making, we're largely aware that there is um, uh, like a fast system, which is often uh, a system that is, uh, kicks into place when you have to make a quick decision, um, which is often um, emotional or based on stereotypes or habits that we have. And then there is the slow thinking system, which is um, more rational and logical and sort of thought out. Okay. So that kind of already puts things in an interesting perspective that not all decisions are, um, are rational in nature. And there is a, a conscious role for uh, emotion when one is making any decision in life. And that has begun to um, contribute and has led a lot to uh, increasing thought, combining this with the notion of building good relationships is the area of social and emotional learning. Okay. So largely social and emotional learning is, um, is described as competencies to build uh, social connections, critical for human relationships, um, manage emotions. And uh, the idea is to be able to use these in establishing positive relationships, resolving conflicts, um, maybe on an everyday basis. And of course, to sort of prepare us to some, in some ways of handling uh, different challenging situations. Okay. So let's look at um, the social brain, which is something that uh, one would want to specifically train and, um, and cultivate for good relationships. And so um, two processes that um, I want to talk about here are, one is the ability to mentalize, which is the process by which we read the mental states of others. And uh, a second, which is to make predictions about what those mental states mean. Okay. 
And uh, we do all of this every day as we interact with the world. And um, that's also a bit of a challenge, like, you know, when I'm speaking to you right now, normally in a classroom, I would have loved to have watched your faces as we speak so that I'm able to gauge whether this is making sense to you, is this of interest to you? But um, with cameras um, off, there's, I can't, I, I, I cannot make those predictions anymore, okay? So that's a big loss that we often have when we are doing some of these uh, presentations without being able to engage with the audience, okay? The other is the emotional brain, okay? And the emotional brain has uh, assumed new importance uh, simply because emotions play uh, such an important role in our everyday lives and in um, us, the different brain states that we encounter and go through in the course of a day. Uh, what we clearly know is that positive emotions um, serve as states of happiness and reward and, um, and help build resources, which in turn leads us to probably engage in positive behaviors and cooperation. At the same time, um, uh, negative emotions uh, can lead to states of conflict, which in turn can lead to um, despair, anxiety, and depression. Okay. So having with this um, sort of background in mind uh, at, at MGIP, we developed uh, a framework for social and emotional learning that if we are to cultivate um, and build social emotional capabilities in young people and in adolescents particularly, uh, what are the four feet or what about maybe some of the competencies that we want to consciously build and especially competencies that have been uh, studied and have been known to be able to aid to people's well-being. So the three that came in specifically from social emotional well-being uh, were um, mindfulness, empathy, and uh, compassion. And there are uh, descriptors uh, on the slide on what each, uh, building each of those competencies would entail. And then the notion of, uh, of critical inquiry, which is uh, clearly important in order to be able to uh, take action, which is uh, towards a larger good. And at, at least to be able to contemplate about whether one is um, doing the right thing. So it's important to have uh, cog cognitive, explicit cognitive engagement in what the outcome of the decision is going to be. So that's where the critical inquiry comes in. And so we call it the EMC squared framework. Okay. So SEL skills build social connections. Um, and are focused on building, managing emotions, decision-making, and empathy. And then interestingly, there is a field of digital games, okay, which also require you to do active decision-making as you navigate the game, uh, experience both reward and failure, uh, to take different perspectives as you navigate the game so that you are um, able to play the game well. And in the process, um, as, as multiplayer gameplay uh, evolves, also really, uh, engage in more uh, social connections and maybe forming new cooperations and collaborations. And so in the last few years, there has been much interest in trying to use digital games as, um, as a playground to try and cultivate social emotional skills, both to teach and to practice. And because uh, they are engaging and rewarding, uh, and uh, one of the one of the most uh, creative ways in which games are being used are also for SEL assessment. Okay, so without even um, specifically being assessed, just by the kind of choices that you make as you navigate the game, uh, you we actually get an insight into what um, people's underlying uh, SEL skills might be. Okay. So you'll be surprised to know that uh, the games industry is that big and, um, and the numbers are now um, such that there are as many women playing games as there are men. Um, they are also have assumed a new importance because uh, they are playful and they engage the brain in ways um, which regular classroom teaching does not do. Okay? We all love to engage in play. 
And, uh, and so there is now um, serious attention devoted to trying to uh, bring back uh, the game, the game and playful pedagogy into the classroom to try and make classrooms more rewarding in terms of uh, learning situations. Okay. But at MJIP, one of the one of the conscious calls that we took was um, that just playing a game might not be enough to cultivate the specific skill that we want to. And so um, we took a very conscious effort to build something called a game-based course. Okay. So the way a game-based course works is that one uses the narrative of um, the game, and therefore, you know, one is probably to some extent restricted by the kinds of games one can choose. Uh, use that the way one would say use a story okay, to make a case for what is the competency that one is trying to teach. So you get people and kids to play the game. And then you might either pause the game in specific places and take the child into a specific learning space. We're all talking about, in this case, online learning spaces and trying to design activities, not just text, but making sure that um, there is an interaction, there might be videos that might be accompanying that, you might want to try and have different kinds of responses, um, but try and make the online um, environment such that uh, students are actually able to, able to use the narr narrative of the game, but begin to consciously engage in decision-making and uh, question themselves on the decisions that they make and, um, and also try and see how in order to achieve certain outcomes, further decisions might be influenced. These have also emerged as very um, fertile grounds to engage discussion especially bringing in different perspectives as different people play the game. So here I'm going to pause a little bit and um, let you watch for a few seconds uh, the game that we chose for um, the course that I'm going to talk to you about. So enjoy. <laughs> The game, as you probably figured out by now, is uh, Bury Me, My Love. And uh, it's the story of Noor as she's um, fleeing Syria to Europe. And uh, we all have to play the, the person playing the game has to play the role of Majid, that is her husband, and help her navigate the journey so that she's able to make it to Europe safely. And um, almost nobody uh, gets it gets it through in the first try it can be quite uh, uh, frustrating but it can also be very rewarding as you actually play the game but this was this game achieved um, uh, got a number of awards and it's primarily you can see a set of message uh, messages that are exchanged between uh, Noor and her um, husband as she plays uh, as she navigates this but it also brought to fore a very um, uh, interesting way to bring in discuss with children 
the theme of migration. Okay. And, um, and that's what we built the course uh, around which. So one of the themes that, um, that UNESCO works a lot about on is refugees, the refugee crisis and migration. Okay. It also gave us a way to contextualize the whole idea of migration uh, in a larger context. That is, uh, you know, you can start talking about migration in the context of uh, birds and animals and when they migrate and then take it uh, to a larger context. Okay. So all of our courses are built on a learning platform called Framerspace, okay, which is, um, it's, an, it's a free platform. It's interactive. It uh, also allows you to create assessments um, in the courses, within the courses themselves. You can embed um, audios, videos, um, uh, a number of uh, applications. You can game, gamify things. Uh, it, has, it has a lot of capabilities and it's free. Okay. And uh, it's also GDPR compliant. So students can actually uh, find a way to be able to discuss fairly sensitive issues without um, too much worry about, uh, you know, sort of getting big, exposed or identified or whatever. So we designed a course around um, Bury Me My Love and called it Identity in Crisis. And the idea was to um, explore the theme of migration, home and belonging, and to specifically uh, build competencies of empathy, mindfulness, compassion, and critical inquiry, and thereby also examine um, the whole uh, notion of the refugee crisis. Okay. So what you're seeing on the right are some of the other courses. And what I will now show you is what the course looks like on Framer Space. Now, in this case, you play the game from start to finish and then um, uh, come on to framerspace.com to, act to actually do the course, okay? So there are three modules. Um, one each on migration, home and belonging, identity and dreams. And there are a number of um, activities within, um, within each of these courses. And it takes um, roughly about, <clears throat> excuse me, 16 to 18 hours to go through the entire course. Okay. Now, what we wanted to see was, was it possible uh, to actually try and um, design a study to see whether this course was actually cultivating the competencies that we thought it was supposed to do. Okay. So here's again an, a, a little illustration of what are the kinds of questions you can ask on Framer Space linked um, to the course and the game and to make sure that the course is linked and contextualized to the game so that students stay interested in uh, what they are going through. So you're, one, one can um, analyze this, this data in multiple ways by actually looking at the responses themselves, as well as looking at uh, pre and post responses. Okay. So here is what a student who's doing the course would encounter, respond to, and this is all collected at the back end. Okay. So we designed a, a short study, okay, which um, had, um, pre-assessments, gameplay, the course, and a post-assessment, okay? And um, we were lucky enough that we, were, we had sort of managed to do this study during the pandemic uh, and had uh, students from India and the UAE participate. So it also gave us a little insight into looking at cultural differences um, between the two um, countries if there might be. So uh, there were about... Uh, a total of 201 participants, 89 from India, 112 from UAE, but equal numbers of males and females. And these were largely children in the age group of uh, 14 to 15. Okay. We assessed them on um, three measures. We looked at um, knowledge and attitudes about migration, um, used the basic empathy scale to look at the notions of empathy and um, compassion. Okay. And so since there wasn't really a, a standardized questionnaire available, we developed a, a subscale to look at migration and refugees. And in the context also wanted to try and see how much awareness people had about other cultures. So looked at respect for cultures, interest in other cultures, a cognitive and affective empathy. And we looked at three aspects of compassion, self-compassion, compassion to others and compassion from others. Okay. And it's, it's interesting to see that a lot of the recent data has begun to 
uh, emphasize a lot the need to, especially in adolescents uh, and young girls, to cultivate self compassion. Because if one is compassionate towards self, uh, there is a high probability one will also be seek compassion and uh, and be compassionate towards others. Because during adolescence, there is also a, a sort of a revision or um, of the sense of identity that uh, young people are building for themselves. So it's important to build um, a notion of identity for yourself, which is healthy and positive. So you can also seek that in others. Okay. So in terms of um, the questionnaire for migration and attitudes, we looked at uh, awareness about migration, respect for people from other cultures, and interest in learning about other cultures to give you more details about uh, how many items were in the stud in the survey, and then we obviously had to standardize it. Um, for empathy, uh, and for those of you who might not be familiar with the basic empathy scale, the um, affective empathy has uh, questions which are along the lines of, of the capacity to feel uh, an emotional response when you're confronted with uh, the emotional state of another person, okay? And typically in the context of friends, when you're, if a friend is upset, are you upset also or not? You know, in terms of how much are you able to resonate with the emotions of uh, your friend? And cognitive empathy is you can um, often understand uh, people's feelings. So you're often able to understand or read another person's emotional state. So relating it to sort of the idea of mentalizing that we talked about earlier on. Okay. Uh, Compassion, um, we used Gilbert scale, which has three components, which is self-compassion, which is reflecting on when one needs to be kind with to oneself, okay? And uh, how it's important to probably begin to think about oneself also uh, in situations, and especially during adolescence where uh, young people form a number of deep relationships, that engagement of, look, of looking out for oneself can sometimes get lost or distorted. Compassion towards others where uh, in order to actually improve someone's state because of um, despair that they might be in, it's important to also distance yourself. If you uh, have very strong senses of empathy, it can lead to empathic distress. So it's important to be able to have a sense of uh, cognitive awareness to be able to recognize when one needs to take some positive actions so, so that the other person can actually uh, try and be held to a positive state. And then of course, to be also uh, in a state to receive compassion from others, okay. Uh, and that's something that people also struggle with quite a bit. So as they played the game and they did the course, we looked at pre and post differences, okay. Um, interestingly, in terms of the knowledge competencies, we did see um, a significant uh, increase in both in um, kids from UAE and in India, as well as respect uh, for other cultures. Okay. Um, the, in terms of compassion, significant effects were really seen only in uh, females for receiving compassion from others. Uh, and then since we didn't see specific um, uh, increases in, in self-compassion, what we also went ahead and did was to do correlations um, uh, across the different scores. And a couple of things that um, arose from that analysis was that um, you do see a positive correlation between self-compassion self and compassion towards others. So, so whilst one did not see a significant difference in the basic score, we do anticipate um, based on this correlation that uh, you there would be some increase in um, self-compassion along with an increase towards compassion to others. Uh, similarly, we also found that the moment there was an increasing interest in other cultures, uh, there was also an improvement in compassion. And then there was a correlation between self-compassion and um, affective empathy. And that is, uh, does the ability to recognize and to experience the emotions of others, uh, can that become a deterrent? And so that 
was negatively correlated. So sort of providing us some indications of empathic distress that if you get very strongly um, involved or affected by others' emotions, you could uh, lose sight of your own emotional states and there, that could deter you from taking positive action towards improving the states of others. So this was our first attempt at trying to, um, to use um, digital games as uh, a promising pedagogy in, uh, in classrooms, okay? And um, we've, we've continued to build on this uh, further and used it in uh, a couple of other notions. Over the next um, five minutes, I just want to share with you a new study that we are just about to uh, embark on. And this is on a game called Sky, okay? which is a multiplayer game. It's, it's free. And, and um, share with you how we want to go ahead with that design so that in case you had uh, additional comments to add that we could possibly explore, that would be very valuable here. So this is what Sky looks like. So Sky looks at um, um, the course around Sky is uh, on developing pro-sociality. Okay. And one of the things I didn't mention earlier, but uh, NGIP's broad vision is to build kinder brains. And so pro-sociality is uh, uh, something that we believe in uh, very strongly okay, in wanting to build skills to uh, in, in, in all people and especially children early on to try and um, try and make better the lives of others too okay? and to be able to um, to do this in a in a very normal um, everyday way so that it doesn't seem like a, a special thing to be want to do so building kindness is something that we do very consciously so some of the questions that um, we want to use is uh, see as to whether it's possible to build again pro sociality using um, uh, a game-based intervention. And here we want to try and do um, a slightly stricter study design, okay? Where uh, we want to try and unravel and unpack if there is a, what's the effect that a game might play versus a game-based course might play, okay? And the experimental design is currently such that where you might have um, four groups of people, one who actually engage in gameplay of only Sky, one who do uh, engage in gameplay as well as do the course on Framer Space, one group of people who only do the course on Framer Space, okay? they don't play the game at all. And the others are just people who uh, play a game but not Sky. And do we see a change in pro-sociality? Because uh, pro-sociality is something that we all have to some measure but how much of that is that um, able to impact? And then um, go on to also explore how much of this might actually um, be long lasting is, uh, does it persist? And, and one of the, uh, the ideas that one would like to explore here is that uh, the evidence right now suggests that pro-sociality is so rewarding to human beings that um, just like, you know, you want to go back and, uh, have a bar of chocolate um, because you know you're going to feel rewarded. Uh, engaging in pro-social behavior is, can be so rewarding that uh, one would want to go back and engage in it as much as possible because it 
it makes you feel good too, not just the person you're doing uh, that for. So that's where we are at uh, right now. These are some of the scales that we want to use to be able to um, undertake the study and to see in terms of gameplay, how, whether some factors of gameplay also play a role in uh, actually helping us cultivate this. So that's where I'll stop. And this is something that we are starting out in August. And um, I'm happy to take questions. Superb. Thanks so much, Nandini. It's a fascinating talk. Uh, so we've got some time for questions now. Um, I'm going to uh, take uh, Chair's prerogative and ask the first question. Um, so the, the different types of, of medium for instruction, such as books and, and videos and, and games, are probably appropriate for learning different types of skills uh, and, and maybe for, for different types of ages. Um, of, of the sorts of, of gaming environments you're looking at, um, which are the, are the skills best suited for teaching via that kind of medium, do you think? So I think one of my own um, take on this is that perspective taking is the skill that I find um, is probably one of the best um, uh, amenable to the gameplay environment simply because uh, it's, it is really difficult to put yourself in other people's shoes, but a gameplay environment can allow you to get on to play or take on different roles and um, to some extent experience that uh, quite well. Uh, it's, it's also interesting how, um, uh, and this is more anecdotal evidence, is um, how uh, youngsters who want to maintain a certain image will often, often not want to indicate that they could be kind or nice. And uh, I mean, it's strangely, this we see this a lot and we've seen this a lot in young boys, but in a gameplay environment can actually be really kind and nice. And it's somehow interesting to try and um, begin to encourage them to say that it's okay to also be kind and nice uh, even in, in real life. So if we are able to do some of that, I think uh, that should certainly make them happier people and the people around them. Great, thanks. So we'll go, go to the chat bar, some questions here. So Sarah says, uh, I'm interested in how the course was delivered to the young people in the study. Was it all sure. online or was there any support from a teacher stroke course leader giving context or support to the participants? So uh, when we did the Bury Me My Love study, um, we the course was completely delivered online. But we uh, did do some training with the teachers in the sense that we encouraged them to be to play the game themselves and the, do the course themselves, so that when students um, had issues, the teachers could provide some kind of support online. Uh, we also encourage teachers to uh, intervene. So maybe if you're playing the game uh, during the course over four weeks, if um, if once in 10 days, they could have a discussion in class around what was being played in the game. Okay. But there was um, not, no specific structure that was provided by us. We were just encouraging the teachers so that there is interaction and discussion around the game. In uh, the second, uh, now that when we are implementing it now, the discussion board um, on the platform works much better. So we are actually hoping to uh, try and consciously have um, engage in discussions at specific points as the course is uh, taken on to also begin to try and see if in the course of discussions, we can begin to see shifts in uh, in young people as or, or in the discussions in terms of perspectives, you know, so you come in with a certain idea and you sort of push for it strongly, but as the discussion sort of evolves, can that begin to, to shift a little bit? And because uh, this is all um, sort of online text without, um, explicitly going into the names of individuals because we just have their frame space IDs, begin to do some post hoc analysis of semantics, semantic test, uh, text to be able to see whether sentiment actually does begin to change in, in conversations. So this is, this is quite, um, this is sort of new, new areas of work, so not too much available. So we're sort of finding our own path there. Great, fantastic. Uh, question from Nina. Uh, she said, I'd like to know what the timeframes are for the pre-assessment 
gameplay and post assessment. And I guess I'll throw in, was, was there any longer term follow up to see how long the effects lasted for? So unfortunately for the first uh, course we did, we could not do um, the follow up. We had wanted to do one three months later, but um, in the in the newer study we have, as we're talking to schools, we have requested that we, when they come on board to be able to allow us to do a follow up one month later and three months later. In terms of uh, the time taken for the questionnaires, we try and uh, make sure that the total time across all questionnaires does not exceed uh, 45 to 50 minutes. And we try and pace it a little bit. So not to have all the questionnaires uh, done in one day, but possibly over 48 to 72 hours. Um, but I've also you know, sort of come to see um, how, how kids very quickly can game the system. So uh, people will just go on and just keep clicking on. So this year, this time we've very consciously included a, a social desirability scale too to be able to also look at impacts of those that might influence uh, our findings. Uh, the course is roughly between um, 16 to 18 hours. So over a two week um, or a three week period, uh, students can take that. There are uh, schools that are willing to have uh, kids do this over maybe play uh, three hours in a week and structure it uh, through that. We've been trying to convince uh, parents to be able to allow us to pilot this uh, before we take it to schools. But parents are very difficult to convince because they are convinced that once you introduce their child to a game, there's just no way the child will ever turn back. And um, so we've, we've tried to encourage them to say, why don't you play it first yourselves? And if you find it interesting enough, maybe you can you know, encourage your kid to do that. And maybe this might build better communication skills between parent and child too. Uh, there are a couple of people who volunteered for that, and maybe in six months' time, I can come back and tell you how that went. Great, thanks. Uh, Kay says, health-related links to uh, the empathy condition seem to offer some promising insights into comorbidities. Can you speak to this angle of your work? Ah, I wish I had um, something more tangible to, to contribute to that. Um, I certainly see over a period of time um, in terms of comorbidities as we collect more data that um, I will be able to speak to that uh, a little better. But at this point in time, I have um, very little to say in terms of um, comorbidities and how they might influence this because we've, we've collected very, um, very scant data in terms of other conditions. And um, the platform when we were starting that out wasn't uh, collecting that much demographic information about and backgrounds about children too. Uh, so sorry about that. Not too much that I can offer at this point in time. Okay, but some promise for the future, I hope, with bigger studies to come. Uh, Gwen asks a, a factual one, are Framer Space courses and associated games freely available for education services and schools and how can they be accessed? Absolutely. Uh, so you go to framerspace.com and there are courses for teachers, courses for young students between the ages of, um, say, 12 and above. There are courses on uh, climate change, on biodiversity, global citizenship, and they're all interactive courses, so they can be um, quite a lot of fun. Uh, and of course, there are game-based courses. One of the challenges that we had with Berry Be My Love was that um, even though we managed to talk to the developer and bring up, bring down the price to a dollar for the download, there were a number of kids who were not able to play the game at all because it involved a price component. And that's why very consciously for the next one, we chose a, a freely available game, which has um, no price associated with it. So we are hoping that many more kids will actually take that. And want to really exploit the multiplayer nature of it. If there are any um, courses that you would like to sort of discuss more, please feel free to reach out to me and um, we'd be happy to support this in any way. But as of now, everything is available for free use. And they're all certified. So, so students who take them at the end also get a certificate from UNESCO MGIP, which I believe uh, can be encouraging. Great. Uh, Flavia says, thank you, Nandini, for this inspiring talk. Can you please provide some detail about the students' online experience in the first study? 
So how many hours playing the game, self-paced or monitored in class? Is there any guidance from teachers or is it, an in, is it individual learning? What led to adherence to the game sessions? So um, these, the, this was during the pandemic. So um, teachers helped us in trying to uh, facilitate gameplay um, during uh, teaching hours in one school. Okay. But in, in two other schools, and there were five schools uh, from India and five from uh, the UAE that participated, uh, some of this was sort of done by kids uh, themselves. So uh, there were, I would say there was about 20% attrition through the course, which I think is not bad at all, given that it was an online course. Uh, they must have played the game for about um, eight to 10 hours because different people progress through the game at different rates. But the course does never goes beyond uh, 14 to 16 hours and is typically paced across uh, uh, four weeks. Four to five weeks is what we encouraged uh, uh, students and teachers to, to follow the game and the course. Uh, in the case of Sky, which is again, um, uh, a slightly different mod model in the sense that Students will play the game, come to the course, play the game, come to the course. So there's going to be a back and forth. So that's going to be a new experience for us too. And uh, it's really a credit to the game that um, students stay engaged. Okay, So which is why selecting a game that is really engaging and uh, is, is, is a critical part for ensuring compliance uh, uh, through the study. In, <laughs> interestingly, the kids who who did drop out, <laughs> dropped out more because of parental pressure than uh, their interest in the game. But that's something that that comes in with this uh, technology. It's just that I think um, as people are beginning to realize uh, that the skills that kids get out of these games uh, and it begins to when it begins to impact their lives um, uh, at home and in school, that uh, that's when parents are beginning to kind of agree that this might not be such a bad uh, idea. Moderation is always a challenge uh, in gameplay, uh, but it also, I think, in some ways makes uh, us more aware that if we are able to create games that are so engaging, it's really important that we make teaching as engaging as possible. And therefore, that's something that students will still like. So I think it kind of shifts the responsibility back onto us to make sure teaching in the classroom is as interesting as gameplay. <laughs> Super, thanks. Uh, Astrid has a, a, a question comparing the two different games you talked about. Uh, she says, in Bury Me, My Love, communication between the characters appears to be mostly verbal or text-based. In Sky, you have to unlock the ability to communicate via text. So most players communicate via in-game body language or emotes. Do you have any thought right now on what effects these different communication methods might have? Um. I have some thoughts right now only, and um, uh, I, I, I dare say that um, uh, from the experiences that we see in terms of young people on how they prefer to communicate, one of the things in, um, in Bury Me My Love is the conscious use of only text, okay? And, and that's where uh, we found that um, uh, after at some points in time, there were people who gave up the game, but actually came back and did, completed the course because um, uh, the course had different modalities uh, available. Uh, in, I also at some points in time felt that because it was completely um, in English, and in this case, though we tried to ensure that uh, the kids were proficient in English and you know they'd gone to English medium schools, et cetera, we were restricted in some ways in, um, in allowing all kids to, have the full gaming experience because of the restriction to the English language okay, in terms of text. In that sense, I think um, Sky might actually be um, a little more inclusive and might give us uh, interesting nuances in terms of um, perspectives that young people might, who come in from even different cultures uh, and allow it to become more participatory. So that's where um, I am in right now in the sense I'm expecting over for Sky, we would have much more engagement and willingness 
from many more people to be want to want to participate. So whilst for uh, Bury Me My Love, some many most people started out, I think as the language became um, a little heavy, they kind of, you know, sort of lost out or dropped off. We won't have those challenges in Sky, I hope. Super. So we are getting to the end of the questions now. There are a couple of um, requests, uh, maybe for your email address to um, to follow up. So maybe we can do that in the chat bar uh, at the end when we finish. Uh, even even an offer to um, get studies running in schools in uh, Mexico. So that will be well, exciting. I'd love that. I'd love that. Please do send me an email and I'd love to do that because we're running other work in Mexico. So that would be really nice. And I will drop in... Um, uh, links. I will drop in my email address here and a link to frame a space. Super. So in that case, I will finish with a couple of bigger blue sky questions. So assuming we we get this gamification use of the game environment, which has all these potentials, assuming we we get this up and running, and, and it becomes much more uh, prevalent in classrooms. Um, how do you see this working with like teacher autonomy? Are you sort of taking skill sets away from them because they're kind Not of- at all. The Not at all. I, I actually um, uh, find increasingly that um, teachers who are uh, receptive and who are, um, who are growing uh, and beginning to accept technology into their classroom uh, can actually begin to engage in uh, many more interesting discussions in the classroom. If they are just like if they are able to use um, uh, AI effectively in their classrooms, if they are able to bring in the power of games to be able to uh, create situations, you know, for example, you know, talking, uh, about um, about history, you know, bringing in characters and beginning to try and bring some of those things come alive, or even looking at a novel, you know, um, who's afraid of Edith Finch? I don't know if any of you have heard of that uh, game. It's a beautiful novel that is being made into a terrific game, and use that as a means to uh, encourage children to be creative, to begin to realize the different nuances of characters. I think uh, uh, if teachers are just able to realize the potential of what gameplay is able to do in terms of children engagement. Any day have a child in your classroom who's engaged and interested uh, because of a format of presentation rather than a disinterested child who just learn by rote. I think uh, that's where some of the magic will begin to happen. So I think teachers should just keep their minds open and start gaming. So, so let's go with that. Now, right now, teachers um, are able to edit their own PowerPoints, their own um, written materials. Do you, do you see a world where, where teachers have some kind of training to, to edit oh, games? Yes, absolutely. In fact, um, uh, on Framer Space, we have something, uh, we have one course on helping teachers build their own game-based courses, okay? And we've actually run workshops in the, pro in the past where uh, we bring in a bunch of teachers who've never gamed before, introduce them to games and then gotten them to select a game and showed them how they might actually develop a course around it. And uh, in, in this case though, we've, we've done only in-person um, workshops. So just like two workshops, but teachers have gone on to actually develop courses and uh, it, it's been successful. It's, it, there have been, all, I think uh, almost in the last three years, we've had about more than 150 teachers who've gone and developed game-based courses, which I think is a fantastic beginning. Super. Last question before, before we let you go. Um, this is obviously even to access a, a textbook, in effect, that is behind a paywall because you have to buy a textbook. Um, but, but do you see any other issues about sort of big business getting involved in, in games, such as, you know, chat GPT being behind a paywall or the, these kind of issues? So um, it's it, it's one of the one of the questions we are hoping to address a little more um, very as early as next week. So next week I'm uh, attending an interesting conference in New York City called Games for Change, which is an annual conference, and they've increasingly been seeing the number of um, uh, companies that are coming in to engage in this space. 
what many of them have not realized is that the gaming industry, besides just being one for entertainment, has, has a lot of value in education. Okay? And, and that's a conversation that's um, now beginning to uh, get some traction okay, because of some of this work that's coming out. And so we need, firstly, um, some more people to begin to come on board to start using some of these uh, games in classrooms. But the appetite for wanting to um, make these sort of uh, freely available after some kind of, an, you know, their, their initial returns have been sort of gotten by or whatever uh, is certainly improving because making good games is also apparently very expensive business. So they, they invest a lot in, in coming up with that. So they say we need to actually get those returns. But the way we try and um, uh, are trying to engage with them is that if you are able to bring them into education, we can actually, over a period of time, try and, try and cultivate a series of skills as kids get older. You can actually have rubrics that are based across timelines and development. And, and if your game can be the anchor that allows people to do that, they can just be small snippets that kids could begin to use to be able to continue to engage in skill development. And maybe some of those kids can start to contribute to developing parts of those games too. So that's becoming um, another area that um, is, I think, uh, interesting to them because they are now beginning to see young people as co-developers in some of the some of the issues that might be of interest to uh, adolescents and teenagers in the world. Super, thanks so much, Nandini. Well, we will wrap up this seminar. It's been a fascinating uh, talk uh, and fascinating discussion afterwards. So, thanks so much for uh, sparing the time to talk to us today. Thank you very much for staying on, and have a good summer. Bye bye. <laughs>